Hi, Mike Sinclair with uh, Hardware Lab. Hard that Patrick directs. Yeah, the guy. <laughs> the guy with flesh color here. Sorry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no HR people here? I'll, I'll get you next. And anyway, he and I go back a long time. Uh, we, we grew up in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and I sent around a CV, which takes a long scroll to read through. Um, you, you probably read the highlights on the, on the talk announcement. But he got his um, um, graduate training on up at the University of Pennsylvania in biophysics. Well, I started biochemistry, but I met Britton Chance, and he said... No, Steve, you got to do biophysics, so that's it. Anyway, uh, went to school with Candace Bergen at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, was honored with a Turon scholarship, and he attended uh, Trinity College in Cambridge for a year, right down the hall with Prince Charles, yeah. who he got yeah. to talk to. Dinner with the Queen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Coffee, and he became tea, uh, tea, tea. a professor of a number of... of uh, of universities uh, in and around Boston and, and uh, Philadelphia, Shea Eye Institute. He was vice chairman, chairman of ophthalmology, ophthalmology department. And um, one thing that I like to brag on him, uh, besides I'm always Steve's brother uh, when we were in close in, in, in high school, was that uh, he gets interested in, in anything and everything, just like me. Everything's shiny around there and grabs our attention. Even though he's an ophthalmologist of the retina, most of his patients are, uh, are afflicted with uh, diabetes, and he got interested in the endocrine system, learned all about it, and, and uh, uh, was the president of the uh, American Diabetes Association for two years, the Pennsylvania chapter. So that's how he gets involved, and he, he believe me, he's very passionate about what he does, and he, as you find out, um, gets very involved in what he's interested in. And he's going to talk to you about what he truly is interested in. So... Oh, um, growing up, we got a <laughs> couple of science fair awards on hypothermia, clue to suspended animation. He let me build his electronic equipment. I built a, a defibrillator for bringing rats back to life and uh, a diathermy machine, nice. which was, the easy way I can, I can uh, uh, describe it, it's a handheld um, microwave oven I built for bringing the, the rats back to life when a desk lamp just cooked them. So... <laughs> Anyway, and then we t uh, tested their brain activities, and then we were both in the amateur rocketry club. We would launch them and try to get them into low Earth orbit, but we didn't even come close. So, anyway, Steve Sinclair. North, North Phoenix. Okay, so um, as Mike explained, I'm an ophthalmologist. I don't know if you know how to spell that, but uh, my responsibility here is to entertain you for the next hour or so. Um, I have two purposes that I have to outline at the beginning. The first is um, I appreciate all of the things that you're trying to do in the assist world for VIPs, visually impaired people. I want you to better understand what their vision problems are so that then you will be better enabled to take care of them and assist them. My second is that um, uh, I, I am impassioned by this, but I would like to... Um, be associated in your projects. I'd like to help however I can, by phone or whatever. Um, but I also want to get you interested in some of my projects. So those are my two purposes here, okay? To help you to better understand about the visually impaired person and then hopefully to develop some camaraderie and um, forward motion. Okay, so, whoops. There we go. First, a little bit of anatomy here, okay? So this is an eyeball. The two eyeballs are positioned looking hopefully at the same target in the distance by six muscles that have to be derived by the brain input that overlays those two images. And inside the eyeball, uh, just like a camera, you have a lens in the front that is uh, a bag of gel so that muscle contracts and pulls that lens so that's what allows you to focus in and out. The lens, as you age, becomes more hardened. That protein becomes more hardened and fractured, and that produces the glare, the haze of a cataract. Okay? In the back is, uh, most of you are young enough that you probably don't know what film is. Okay? <laughs> that film, the retina, notice how it's the yellow line here that stretches all the way around. The inside of the eye gives us our wide field of vision. Takes the picture, so to speak. But then, of course, it has to send the image 
through the optic nerve to the brain. And of course, you've got to have a little bit of brain back there that overlays the two images to allow you to see one image. And we'll talk about depth perception. OK? That's the normal eye. The center of that retina is the macula. That's what gives us our best um, focused vision in the center. OK. Here's the cataract. And when you develop a cataract, the surgeon goes in and sucks out the cloudy protein and inserts a lens most often inside the capsule that remains. This lens is most often a single focus lens. So they try to focus you out there to distance. And you have to wear reading glasses to fine tune that focus for up close. They're developing new lenses that if you want to, we'll talk about those. There are a lot of problems with those. I've testified in front of the FDA about the vision problems that can develop with those. Okay? But in the back of the eye, that macula, this is what we see when we look back there. Here's the optic nerve intact. Here are the blood vessels that are on the inner surface of that retina. The light that is focused through has to go all the way through the inner retina to the rods and cones that are in the outer layer. So you have two vascular supplies, the inner retina that supplies the nutrients for the inner um, two-thirds of the retina. This choroidal blood vessel layer is unique in the human body. Well, both of these are unique. And that choroidal blood vessel has to not only supply the nutrients for the rods and cones, but has to protect it against all of that light energy that's focused on that retina. So we're going to talk about that and what happens. OK. All right. Now, what you need to understand is for the past 200 years or so, the ophthalmologist, optometrist, the eye care providers, and the optics industry have been focused almost entirely on how do I better focus the eye, whether it's with contact lenses, glasses, surgery, or whatever. It's pr predominantly on how do I improve that optical transfer function of the eye. It's only really in the past five or 10 years that we have begun to understand the macular disease that is now throughout the world becoming the major cause of mild, moderate, and severe vision loss. This is because of the huge widespread of diabetes, 33 million in the United States, 30% of whom on the first diagnosis of diabetes already have retinopathy, already have retinopathy. And what we're learning is even that's late in terms of its discovery. But it, it, it accelerates to about 83% of diabetics on the average after 20 years of their diabetes. And it's exploding around the world. The second is macular degeneration. This is a failure of our genes as we age. It's a genetically inherited problem with the inflammatory and protectin of that pigment epithelium between that choroidal blood vessels and the outer nuclear rods and cones. That macular degeneration is now 15 million in the United States, 10 times that throughout the world. So in China, India, in, even in the Middle East, and in, in, although we think of it as a northern European disease, no, it is throughout the world. Okay? One in three people over the age of 20, uh, excuse me, over the age of 70, are developing this problem. Okay? And the third is glaucoma, which is less but still a great significant impact in vision. All right, I'm going to briefly talk about the ETDRS chart, which is the derivative that has come to be from the old Snellen chart, because everybody knows what the top letters are on that Snellen chart, right? Right? Everybody knows, OK? So they developed this chart for the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study. And it's not only that there's five letters on every single line, but there's a standard deviation in terms of three lines equal halving of the visual angle, 2080 to 2040 to 2020, three lines, three log mar. So this is a log mar chart that supposedly was developed because then we thought that an equal amount of improvement, three lines of vision improvement, was going to be the same for everybody, whether you were going from 2080 to 2040 or 2040 to 2020. We now realize that's not the case, but this is what everybody uses. OK? Again, what I want to point out is you're going to hear predominantly about these numbers of this severe vision loss, legal blindness or severe vision impairment. But that group is a small percentage of the entire people that I'm going to talk about that have really severe 
visual impairment in terms of their productivity, their ability to function, their ability to work, and all of those that are almost five to ten times those numbers in terms of their visual problems. Okay. The problem with macular disease is it's chronic, it's insidious, it's progressive. And the problem here is we're discovering it far too late. We're discovering it after everything has failed and the vision has gone down. And although there's three to six billion dollars a year spent in terms of the injections that are given for macular degeneration in this, our ability to recover vision is piss poor, very poor. On average, about one and a half lines of vision improvement on the chart for years of treatment with intraocular injections. And only about a third of them go any significant amount is a three-line improvement in vision. Okay? So what does this mean? It means that instead of the surgeon's mentality, I've got to find the disease after it's progressed, and don't worry, I will take care of you, we have to develop the oncologist mentality, which means screen, screen, screen to pick up the onset, and then predict the progression of the disease. If we can do that, we can manage these, these diseases so much better. Okay? All right. But we're failing this now. And I want to try to tell you why. It's because, first of all, the patients fail to comply. What do I mean by that? I mean that, let's say in diabetics, only about 15 to 35 percent comply with the recommended annual examination. Why is that? Well, it's because whenever I go to the doctor, he has to dilate my pupils, and I lose a whole day's worth or afternoon's worth of function in the office. So a lot of them don't want to go to see the eye doctor until they perceive that there is visual impairment. The problem here, again, is you're walking around with two eyes that the brain merges together, so you often don't perceive a difficulty with your day-to-day -day functioning until the vision is severe, often in the second eye. So they don't go until they see a problem and they think it's their glasses. Okay? The screening by the physician examination is really inferior. Why? Because they're looking with white light at the retina. So only vascular and hemorrhagic lesions can they see it all well. And even that's poor. They can't define changes that are occurring over time. Or well, they say, well, but Steve, I get a baseline photograph, and I look at the patient, and I go back and look at the patient, and I look at the photograph, and I can see the No, I say, no, you can't. No, you can't. All right. Now, we've had improved retinal imaging over the last 10 years or so. We've developed white light cameras that can photograph through an undilated pupil, but they only use white light, and so they have the same limitations as that doctor, they can only see certain lesions in the retina when they do the, the pigmentary changes. We have, here, let's see here, there we go. Well, back up, there we go. So this is what you can typically see here in a patient with macular degeneration. You see the optic nerve on the left, and you see the atrophic dry areas where the vessels have diminished periphery. Yep. Quick question, why is it important to look through an undilated pupil? Because we can get over that encumbrance of the physician giving you the dilation that lasts for three, four, five hours. So they're trying more and more and more to do this. Okay? All right. We have developed scanning laser coherence tomography that provide enhanced structural analysis like this. So you see this line going through this section of the white light, and here you see the structural analysis of that retina there. But the problem here is that the cost is prohibitive often because these better imaging techniques come in cameras that are run at $30,000 to $60,000, $70,000. So predominantly, they're only available in referred physicians. But the other big problem is similar in the radiologic industry. All of the images are interpreted by a physician. Well, you say, well, he should know what hell he's looking at. But the problem is that physician cannot define changes occurring over time. Okay? And what's more, we fail to understand the relationship between those, those changes structurally and the vision changes in that eye. Why is that? Oh, and a third, 
Third is we fail to attach digital measurements to those interpreted fundus findings. And as you know, medicine is going toward a process of where we're trying to develop digital methods of, of following a disease process over time so we can better determine in the individual patient the chronologic progression of those multivariables that define that disease process. So hopefully we can predict the disease and prevent it. But we can't do that with imaging because we cannot now attach quantitative measurements to that. Okay? One of the biggest reasons, however, is because of the way we measure vision. How does every doctor in the world measure your vision? With the eye chart. Okay? We've used the eye chart for 185, almost 190 years. Oldest thing in medicine to use today, older than the stethoscope, it has never been validated. Terrible measure of vision. What does it measure? Come on, gang. What does it measure? It measures the central black against white contrast edge detection in the central one degree of vision. And under one light condition, whatever is the lighting condition in that room or of that chart. So it doesn't measure the world of our colored contrasts. It doesn't measure the adaptation. It doesn't measure low illumination, bright, clear illumination. It doesn't measure our ability to see that. But more so, the person who has macular degeneration is moving his eye around so he can try to get the best clear area over the chart. So often he will say, H. V. So those responses, those perception times are nowhere near what is required for reading, driving, facial interactions, all those things that are daily in our ta vision tasks required of our daily lives, okay? It's m more dependent upon the examiner than the examinee. And believe me, every doctor knows which tech to send in after the procedure that says, oh, look at the improvement that we got in your vision with this surgery that I did. And it's limited by embarrassment, okay? How far am I going to drive you down the chart where you say, Doc, come on, what are you trying to do here? How many doctors start from the bottom and ask you to read up? So it's not a true psychophysical threshold. Poorly correlated with activities of daily living. It's never been validated. Doesn't measure the, what I call the Swiss cheese of central vision. And it doesn't measure distortions in your vision, which when you move your eyes, they create moving distortions, which say when trying to read, it's like trying to follow the bouncing ball. Very hard. Okay? All right. So what I say is the physician fails to understand our real vision problems, the disability. And he doesn't understand the vision loss caused by macular disease, which is different from those previously caused by visual focus or other problems because we fail to measure functional vision. Now, oh, I'm sorry, just very quickly, I'm going to insert in here because I think it's also important for you to understand. The physician really doesn't understand the ocular surface problems. Then primarily I'm talking about here dry eye syndrome. What is dry eye syndrome? Well, as we get older, I'm sorry, I can't use that word. As we become more gifted chronologically, as we become... <laughs> OK? Um, you produce less tears. But on top of that, we're all running around with this inflammation on the back side of the eyelids that screws up the oils that are normally produced onto the tears to help spread out, break down the surface tension, and allow the tears to spread out evenly over your cornea. It produces a lot of inflammation that blocks those tear glands. And what we're now realizing is that with the focused attention that these people have because they have difficulties with their vision, so they're focused at what they're looking at. But all of you do focus on a monitor all day long. And what I say is that God, in her infinite wisdom, didn't design us to do this. Okay? Because what happens is when you're focused at what you're doing, your eyes are not only not moving much, but you're not blinking. Your blinking rates go down to about a quarter of normal. So this is what produces that tearing, that burning, that irritation, that tired eyes. Okay? Now, 
just very quickly, what do we measure? We're measuring ridiculous quantities. We're measuring, yes, the tear volume by putting a little strip there. We're measuring osmolarity. We're taking uh, infrared measure, uh, 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 pictures of the meibomian glands to look for occlusion. But we don't really measure what is important. So I'm trying to develop, working on a device, Ramon hyperspectral camera that will focus and look at the tear film and, it's, and it changes in its constituents and the uh, inflammatory reactions and is this viral, is this um, allergic, is it bacterial or fungal and what are the constituents in that tear film. But we're also, I'm working with Christian Holtz to develop a blink monitor that will blink how often you are blinking during different tasks and we've got to somehow stimulate you. So do we puff it with a little bit of air or do we tweak it or do we say, okay, Mike, come on now, let's blink, 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 blink. So we need something to really help us because just trying to talk about this doesn't remind you to do it. I have a question. Does the use of uh, external drops cause atrophy of producing natural? No. Um, if you're using artificial tears, we usually recommend that you use a, a thicker one. They produce, most of them are just like water. You put them on the eye and they're gone in five seconds. Make a little bit thicker. They're now trying to produce artificial tears that have some of the oils that are missing to put, a, put it on it. Your own, just slow No, down. it doesn't. As far as we know, it doesn't. Okay? All right. All right. Now, okay. So we have this improved retinal imaging through undilated pupils, but um, devices that are available now uh, that are lowering the cost is we have a, a scanning laser, LED, uh, multi-wavelength types of imaging that are bringing down the price significantly. The iPhone lens, I say, no, 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 this is taking, it's got a little lens that you stick on the iPhone and you can take a picture of your retina, but what are you going to do about it? Are you going to mail it, email it to your doc? Um, it it's, has a lot of problems, okay? But what, what we've developed, and I'm happy to share some of that with you, is a cloud-based vendor neutral. So we can take export the images from all the different fundus cap, um, um, L, uh, OCT cameras, all of these, and we export them to the cloud where they're all registered and overlaid. So we can now allow the physician to see changes between all the different instruments and changes occurring over time smart medical image processing system. So here it is where you can see overlying this. You can see the uh, fundus autofluorescence picture, and you can overlay it with the um, OCT images. OK? All right. So if we can use overlay of registered images, I can see changes now occurring over time. Most of the time, this is what you see. So here it's two pictures of an eye with macular degeneration taken about six months apart. I defy you. Can you see differences there? Come on, come on. Can you see differences? One's more blurry. One's more blurry? Well, one's a little bit lighter, darker than the other. That's just because of the... All right, here. Okay, all right. But docs say, I can see the difference because this is the way most often, even with a single camera, the, the images are presented. It doesn't help the physician to interpret what's going on. And People Magazine point this out to me every week. They take one photograph, alter it a little bit, and you've got to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to try to find differences. You can't see that. But if we overlay them, you can see differences immediately in terms of changes. Now, which changes are indicative of progression of that atrophy? That's what we have to define. And which are associated with the vision problems that's what we have to define. But we can look at angiograms. We can look at autofluorescence images. We can look at those OCTs and look at over time. So here's the right left eyes of a fellow with atrophic macular degeneration taken here and a year later. See, look at how these geographic areas have spread to create more areas of smudging in their vision. But how do we define what are the structural important aspects that we can predict that progression in this fellow, that eye, that eye, that eye, that eye. That's what we've got to go. Okay? And we not only have to be able to be able to detect those that are associated with the vision problems, but detect them and analyze them so we can get some quantitative information that will help us to define where that person is going. So I've developed a program called 
AccuDraw. I'm sorry, currently we use only population-based statistics on regular hemorrhagic kind of, it's, it's not very good, but AI programs are now being, they've been, two of them have been approved by the FDA, so we're, we're going there, but right now uh, they're, they're poor, they're not that good, okay? So we need digital quantification, and I do that by allowing the doctor to draw on what he thinks are the important lesions and then we can assign quantitative numbers to that. Areas, perimeters, uh, the, the proximity to the, to the fovea. So we can define how this basically overlays with his vision and look at then what of those changes are predictive over time. So this is a physician-derived way that we can now use crowdsourcing to say, well, how did all of these physicians look at these images and define much better ways of tracking those over time. Okay? All right? It's now being evaluated, so hopefully it will soon be up on the Apple Store. And I think there's all kinds of additional applications which I'm exploring, uh, talking about uh, in neuroradiology, dental photography, and, and dermatologic evaluations. Okay. All right. Now, let's look real quickly at, at vision assessment. Where are we currently? Well, uh, besides the chart that the doctor uses in your office, we have phones now that will present the Snellen chart or the ETDRS chart and maybe do a little bit. But they do not measure functional vision at the, those functional fixation times that I talked about. Okay? 150 to 200, 300 milliseconds kind of things. Okay? All right? And we do do visual field testing. But actually, this is a derivative of an old glaucoma method that just measures your ability to see spots of light that are contrasted against a white interface, not a visual field. We call it that, but it's not an actual visual field. Okay. It's now being done in a much more expensive camera, but at least there they can hold the fundus image and look to see how the visual alterations, at least defined by the Humphrey field spot detections, overlying on top of the macular pathology. So it's beginning to help us to understand that, but still not true vision testing. We can measure distortions. This is foreseen by Annette Lowenstein from, uh, uh, anyway, uh, which, which basically looks at deviations in a line and, and you have to point it out. It, it's a crude measurement that's mainly used to de detect early neovascular macular degeneration. It's not good enough, accurate enough, or inclusive enough to help us assist the person in defining a way that we can help him with those distortions in their vision. Veiling glare is bad, and yes, how do we assess it now? Well, we hold up a little lighted um, hemisphere in front of your eye that you look at the chart through it, and you see how much it drops your um, uh, lines of, of vision, but it's used purely to define for the government whether you can do your cataract or not, take out the cataract, and it doesn't really provide measurements that are important in understanding what the person's disability is um, with regard to glare problems. Okay? All right. I'm going to talk to you briefly about a couple of devices that I've developed. The first is the central vision analyzer, central vision screening, and the um, omni-field, which is a, the, uh, it's a resolution visual field. Okay? Central vision analyzer. Patient sits in a chair, looks at a mirror, at a monitor that presents Landolt C's, round C's that are flipped up, down, right, or left as they're presented. Patient responds with a joystick. We're using now instead of the um, button pad. And so the presentations are at the standard 250 to 300 milliseconds, and we can go up or down in Logmar, actually in between the steps on the Logmar chart. It's a true psychophysical threshold, thresh thresholding from the bottom as well as the top. And we can go up to six different environments to simulate real tasks that you have to participate in during the day. It is uh, vision under stressful conditions. We recognize that correlates with the activity of daily living and, and adapts to patient response. It takes about two minutes to do. Okay. So here's a picture of some of the uh, results. So you see this person with some macular, very mild macular generation. Oh, he has 2013.6. He has better than 2020 vision under high contrast white letters against the black. But put him in a romantic restaurant. All right. And his vision goes down to legal blindness. And even worse, if he's trying to drive at night in that dim atmosphere. Should this guy be driving at night? No, but there's no legal 
prohibition. But you see what this is testing, telling us about that visual function. Here are some glare modules. So what we're trying to do here is to measure your photopic vision under standard lighting conditions in the sun, OK? And oh, I'm sorry, what you see here is under high contrast is not quite as good as the dark screen with bright high Michelson 99% contrast because you have the glare of the screen. And But look, again, what this showed us for the first time is patients with macular disease fail to respond to very bright environments as well as those very dim environments. So you can see the progressive loss. And we use bandpass filters, um, uh, pictures that have been validated in order to show really what. So I can show this to the family and say, look, Uncle Mike shouldn't be driving. Look at what's happening under these conditions, OK? OK. <laughs> OK, FDA approved. And it's been validated against the uh, NEI VFQ25. All right. So I want to show you just some examples here of what this is showing us. So these are several different kinds of pathologies. Wet macular degeneration, epiretinal membranes, dry macular degeneration, cataracts, HIV disease. These were all done by uh, Dr. Gomez down at UCSD. So you see here in a normal person, yeah, they got 20-20 here at, on the ETDRS chart, but under the high um, presentations dropped a little bit, but even under this log mar, the restaurant dining and night driving drops down to 2040 for the normal person. But look at the severe loss, especially the wet macular generation, which if we take the ETDRS chart, they're not bad. But you look at this mesopic kind of um, task that they have to do, severe function, almost uh, legal blindness on the average in these patients. So the ETRS chart is not a reasonable measure of these people's function. OK? Here's another one, OK? And the photopic glare modules that we just talked about. Again, ETRS chart, pretty good here from 2020 to 2032. But even the normal person under sunlight, OK, drops down. And look at the how those others drop down much more severely, 2080, 21. So there's still is not quite as severe as under dim light, but still a se severe compromise in those photopic vision tasks that you have to participate in. OK? All right. So the second uh, thing, I, and I'm going to have to move fast. I apologize. I'm, I'm dragging behind here. OK, so this is the Omni field. It's the first ever resolution visual field. So we present Landolt C's, but we present them at 25 intercepts in the central 20 degrees. Why the central 20 degrees? This is your interactive visual field. Out here, it orients us in space, but this is your interaction. Okay? And all the same thing. We do 20, 250 millisecond presentation, log mar steps, central fixation control using this Toby eye tracker here, and we do these visual measurements. So let's look at, at this. OK, so here's a fellow with just drusen. Drusen is the German word meaning little rocks. Um, you probably thought your husbands had rocks in their heads, but now you've got rocks in the back of the eyes. But look at this, OK? So the visual acuity here was 2025. But what we see here is that that high acuity here was not in the fixation, but off about 2 or 3 degrees. So you see a color coded here as we go down to progressive mesopic levels of how that vision deteriorates. And this is difference from age matched normals, OK? But what you really want to know is how does this guy compare to the normal hill of vision? We use the hill of vision. You've probably heard that term, which means you've got 2020 in the middle. But your vision in all of us drops down to about 2100, 2120 at 10 degrees eccentricity. OK, hold up your hands and show me what is 10 degrees eccentricity from your central vision. Here, 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 here. You're too wide. It's about right there. This 20 it, degrees or plus or minus? No, plus or minus 10 degrees. Oh, plus or minus. 20, 20 degrees, 20, 10 degrees eccentricity, 20 degrees visual field. This is your interaction. Out here, you're legally blind. All you can see is counting fingers. So what does this mean? It means that for normal people, the cone of vision decline from 2020 to okay, 2040 or better is only about six, seven degrees in the center that you have sort of reading capability 
in order to see what's going on. For young people, well, uh, you all are better than us older farts, okay, all right, but which is restricted even with normal people, normal lenses in the age group, that, that hill of vision drops down. But you want to know in the person with macular disease, what is their hill of vision? Where do they have the areas that they can see 20, 40 or better so they can read and do things of that sort? Okay, not just what is their chart acuity. Okay, all right. Therefore, beyond 46 degrees, the, so you see pictures of, 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 of couples when they're looking at each other and they're madly in love and they're looking at each other and their eyes are going all around. Why? Because your facial features are low contrast and you've got to see them with a pretty good resolution. So you, you can't just look at the eyes in the center. <laughs> you've got to look all around. Yes, Mary. Just a question. On this slide, you say 2200 is legally blind, but on one of your earlier slides, you said... 2200 was low vision, 2400 was legally blind, which... That's, that's, that's an, um, uh, that, that is an IRS definition of legal blindness. When you have in the center 2200, that is legally blind. That means you cannot see well enough to hold down a job, drive, even probably take public transportation, things of that sort. Okay, that's a legal definition. All right? Okay, onward. Okay, so here's a person treated with Avastin for macular degeneration, wet, you can see the leaky blood vessels here under the center of the vision, and you can see his vision here. He, now he measures 2060 on the chart. Where in God's name is he seeing 2060? Well, he may be seeing it somewhere sort of right out here at about 6 degrees eccentricity, so he's moving his eye around until he can find that, that area. But look at how severe that vision is below normal because of that small little wet macular degeneration center. Here he's treated with Avastin and still 2060 on the chart. Here the, the neovascularization is shriveled down and the center is still bad, but he's starting to get more vision around the sides. And again here, 2060 again, but he says, Doc, my vision is much better because he's using a lot more of his periaxial vision to function. So we're finding that people can adapt, can refunction, but we've got to better know how to assist them in some sort of rehabilitation therapy and in the assist devices as well so that we can make use of these areas of the visual field. Okay? All right? Okay. Now here's another one. So you say, well, well how do I know that this is anything real? Okay. So here's uh, a engineer who basically had a little vascular occlusion right up here. And now this is flipped. Remember, the patient's facing me, so that's one way. And remember, lenses turn things upside down. So here's this visual field. But what it show, has showed us here is that the vision scotoma is much larger than I would have thought from that little area of the vascular occlusion and leakage. But this engineer... Oh, so the Omni field generated this picture. And this guy in Photoshop drew this. Very similar. The only thing that I didn't have here are the distortions caused by the swelling in that area of his vision. Okay? And so I started asking him, well, down here, I made it much more. He said, no, Steve, you're, you're really right. It's, it, it is more blurry down here. And blah, 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 blah. so we went back and forth and back and forth and looked at the different sectors. So these are realistic interpretations of what the patient is seeing from this, okay? Here's another woman who is an artist. And in, again, in the Omni field generated this picture based on this vascular occlusion, which is not only ischemic here, but has these little extensions, juke, juke, that went up around the fovea right there. So that's juke, juke down here in terms of the vision loss. And so this is what the Omni field generated, and this is what she generated. And I said, Jeannie, all right, yeah, up here where the ischemic retina is, that's pretty bad and everything. But I said, but you didn't, you didn't smudge these here. And she said, oh, Steve, no, 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 you're right. I, 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 I was wrong. I should have done this much more smudged over here. And we talked about the position of this scotoma where she drove, did it mostly. And she says, no, I was moving my eye around a little bit more. So what I'm trying to say is it's quite realistic in terms of the interpretation of this is what the patient is sees. Okay, real quick now. 
So uh, devices in development, where we want to go with this Omnifield is right now we're limited by the um, hardware that we're now using, central 20 degree diameter, 2020. We need to, in order to measure the fine fixations of the very good, especially my pilots that come in, and um, I'm measuring them. But the fixation is monitored by the pu Toby pupil eye tracker, and we're having difficulties with this in patients who wear glasses because of the glare reflected. Our measurement of pupil <coughs> traction is not that good. So where do we want to go? We want to go to an, uh, some sort of a head-mounted display device that will do this for us. So I need to be able to, to, to basically do it. We tried it with off-the-shelf WMR, and although we could put in the lenses and try to put an, an eye tracker and everything in it, it wound up to be, okay, we could do it you know, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our lab, but trying to get a production model was impossible. So the Viva Pro Eye has 28 um, 80, 16 over, but I don't know what the, they're not out in production yet. So I haven't been able to find out oh, that 2880, what is that spread over in terms of the field of view? And they do use a Toby eye tracker that's up, up close in the head-mounted display, but I don't know much about this device. But I'm here to talk to you all about the HoloLens project to see if there's possibility we can do this um, or possibly with the, um, uh, you know, your devices, but I got to be able to track fixation, eye fixation, so I can hold fixation still, or if they're moving their eyes, I can move the presentation to the right intercepts in the visual field and know where I'm measuring them. What kind of speed do you need for the eye tracker? I'm sorry? What kind of speed do you need for the eye tracker? Uh, samples per second? What I don't know. I'll come to that. Okay. <laughs> I got to go back and look that up. I okay. don't know. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't know. Okay, now, but the, the thing that I want to relate to you is doing these visual fields has allowed me to much better see through the eyes of the patient. I can better understand what their visual disability is, and I'm hoping that we can, by better defining the, by assessing the, the, the patient, we'll be better able to develop assist devices and, and, and occupational, I'm sorry, that's, I hate that word. Let's just say it, th therapeutic methods of rehabilitating them, okay? All right. And what this shows is that near vision tasks as well as distance vision tasks are very commonly, our vision is our most precious asset. We want to be able to have this to function. We want to be able to work with it. But on the whole, we're not using assist devices to do that. And my sense in talking with the patients is they're frustrated because their kids will go out and buy them a lens or they'll buy them whatever and they can't use it. So where are we now? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying, I'm, I'm working toward developing a tablet-based, let's call it vision testing app, okay? And the first it will include a, what's called a visual function questionnaire. And this is like a quality of life questionnaire, but it's much more structured because the problem with quality of life questionnaires like the orthopedics, how much pain do you have? One to 10. Well, everybody's going to give you a different number, but these are more structured. This was the first one that was the IVFQ that was um, uh, compared against the NEI VFQ, but we've developed a much better one more recently. So we're testing both, uh, and it's, it's gender-oriented. Um, uh, so near vision under bright light, near vision under dim light tasks, and distance vision under dim light and bright light tasks, but we've also tried to structure the ability so we can compare patients and we can compare over time much better. So this is the VFQ, the first of um, four aspects to this tablet-based function testing for both the office as well as home use. The second is to put the central vision analyzer on a tablet so I can use sweeps as the C's are presented, but uh, since the central vision analyzer doesn't have to track vision, I don't have to worry about it, um, but I got to be able to tell how far the tablet is away from the face in order to make this successful. Okay? I would like to include the Omni field and a new method that Mike and I have been talking about to measure distortions in the vision so we can try to figure out ways to, 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 to work with them, prevent, I don't want to say prevent them, to to counter them so they're not so disturbing when people are trying to read and, and look at things. But we need, we need uh, vision tracking in order to really measure those, okay? So that's waiting. I'm hoping to discuss more about those projects and how that might be incorporated 
into some sort of tablet-based design, hopefully in an app that we can put on the market there for um, general, not only office use, but home use. Okay, now, whoa, I've gone much, much too, too long here. So let's really talk real quickly about assist devices. Okay, the first are, are um, magnifying lenses. And these overall have a lot of problems. The limited field of view, the failure to understand the Swiss cheese of the vision. I just think, well, if I magnify it, I'll be able to see it. Poor positioning and tremors. But the major problem is the failure to understand the light through these things. Because most people will read it. Now, they may have a light in the magnifier, but those are usually LED lights that are glary and piss poor. Now, a lot of people will read. How many of you read with the light over your right shoulder? Your mother told you to read with the light over your right shoulder, right? OK, when you do that, it puts your print in shadow. I've got to tell these patients, read with the light coming in low and from the side, or read in the morning with the light coming through the window to the side. OK, but even with the best of these magnifiers, reading are 15 to 18 words per minute. One word every four. I mean, come on. It's just unsatisfactory, OK? They're now producing some distance magnifiers that are over-the-counter, focusable, using two lenses that were primarily used for sports, but are used a lot by my patients watching TV. And they make some new middle-distance ones so that you don't have to get up real close to magnify to the monitor. You can sit back and use these over-the-counter magnifiers, OK? They have distance glasses that are more patient prescribed or high, dis high, con high uh, magnifiers that surgeons use in surgery. And they're used by a lot of my patients walking around, driving, because you can, where I live, use them. The problem with surgery is you've got coaxial lighting with your lenses. What I'm going to show you is that destroys depth perception. We're going to talk about that, OK? All right. So, oh, how about over-the-counter glasses for glare? OK. Well, most of you, I don't see any glare. I don't see any uh, um, you know, sunglasses here. Uh, you, 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 you pick the ones based on frames, right? Yeah. Right? OK. <laughs> OK. Now, what we have to realize is that in our lighting circumstances, going from dim light, where we really have to function, to very bright sunlight, that's about a 12 log unit change. Only about 10% of that is due to the pupil. The other has to be adaptation of your retina to those huge light levels that takes time, but your retina has to adapt. And at each light level, you've got to have a certain contrast light differential to allow you to see those targets. Though so those targets have to be proportional to the background illumination. And this is why in dim light levels, you can't see because of the overall lighting levels and the contrasts are so minimal at those reduced levels. But also, what we've now reported is that very high saturation levels, retinas in these macro generation patients is it, 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 it fails to it, they're oversaturated, they're bleached. Okay, all right. So an off-axis glare produces severe uh, reduction, the Voss effect on the targets that we're trying to view. Okay, all right. So here's your sunglasses. And it's according to price, frame, design, polarized, all that marketing gizmo that means nothing in terms of vision. I try to recommend to my patients, go into a store and take all the sunglasses outside and try to find the one that, that, that do it for you. Most often, they are not allowed to do that. OK. But if you select the best type and tint, most often, for shopping in fluorescent lighting or monitor glare, they'll pick a pale yellow what's typically called night driving glasses because it reduces the HID headlight glare. That helps to relax the eyes a lot. But in some people that are prone to migraines, it can cause some problems there. So we have to, again, find the tint that is right for you. For sunlight glare, they most often select a much paler amber tint than I would have ever anticipated. Not the dark Maui gyms or whatever, but 
pale amber or amber purple seems to do it. The thing that I've realized is that there's variability on among all my patients. No one choose size fits, fits all. We've got to develop a, a kiosk where you go in and you select the, the tints that are going to do it for you, and then you get your glasses prescribed. Okay. All right. All right, so real quick, assist devices that are electronic, they're paper video magnifiers that will take an image of the paper and basically present it on the screen and allow you to magnify it or they use OCR, but most of them are not internet connected, office or home base use, and they run 3500 to 3000 bucks. The portable ones, yeah, you can take around, but their field of view is much more restricted, much more difficult to use. There's one here that is the New England Low Vision that you can take a picture of here, but you still have to use it with a monitor. So, <laughs> am I going to take it around with both? So we haven't really thought this out, OK? What I am realizing is that the older, more mature generation is, far, is using tablets and laptops far better, far more than I ever anticipated, OK? They're using them for reading newspapers, documents, emails, Facebook, banking, bill paying, FaceTime with their kids and friends, book reading, uh, and gaming. But they're, most of the time, they're, 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 they're playing um, um, puzzle games kind of things on it, OK? And a lot now are using it for online shopping because they can't drive. And it's hard to get their family to take them to the store. And I like to say, well, this is why Amazon bought Whole Foods. I don't know that for sure, but when I go to Whole Foods, that th those, those shipping um, carts are usually stacked with online shipping, sh shopping for, for those local needs, okay? All right? Okay. So the problems, though, that I find, again, from my patients complaining a lot, is these laptops, these tablets don't allow you to really adjust those aspects of the presentations, OK? The mouse pointers, difficult to follow, OK? Touch screen, finger spreading allows you to magnify the print. Yeah, but it doesn't allow you to adjust, and you lose your orientation, and there's a lot of problems with that. It doesn't allow you to adjust personally the screen, the contrast, the illumination, the color management, especially when you're doing internet online shopping. That's what you'd like to do in order to really be able to, and maybe some of the women who are into the color management. You know, it's not part of the Y chromosome. But still, still, we need to allow the person to better personalize that interaction to be able to function. And so although there is OCR, most of them tell them it's boring, it doesn't function, we need to really improve it, OK? All right, so and now other commercial, there's all kinds of online books that my patients are reading more and more and more and more now because they're stuck at home. And so they go on to Audible. Mostly they're using uh, Nooks or Kindles. But when I'm trying to get the local libraries that are now converting more to downloadable for their constituents, they all use different readers. And so this has been a real problem here. OK. Um, these are all um, National Association for the Blind and National Foundation for the Blind produce um, readers. But I find the interactions. Come on, gang. The interactions are difficult. OK. An app that you all have been developing, and I think now is available, isn't it, Mike? The Seeing AI? It, this is, I, I think it's fantastic. And OK, now I realize it's primarily oriented toward the severely vision impaired. But its ability to narrate the world around you, to sort of help you to know what's going on, and to describe the people that you're seeing and what they're doing and their facial recognition, I think this is great. Do any of your patients report using Not yet. Yeah. Because I haven't recommended it yet. Mary, I've got to start doing I just started reviewing these things when Mike and, and well, some sent them in. OK? No yeah. All right? I think it's remarkable. But I want to tell you where you need to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Head, yeah, I know. We're almost out of time. So OK, real quickly. Most of the head-mounted, commercially available devices help the person. The first was the Geordi, autofocus, then the eSight, uh, video cameras, looking forward to, to all, and you could allow you to alter the contrast and the focus. The C-Boost, which is, which is 
um, it fit onto the glasses, so it allows you to look through one eye with the glasses and the other, but it's purely an audible um, uh, a contrast adjustment uh, and um, a, a illumination adjustment that you can do with the handheld uh, vision there. The OrCam I think I like the best. It's got this little camera right here on the edge of the glasses, and it's purely um, uh, audible. So it will read, so you point to a text or something that you want to read, and it'll read it for you. I haven't had any personal experience with it, but I think it has a lot of applications that we're going to talk about in a second, okay? Real quick. Now, some of the Microsoft um, VR uh, programs and stuff that you're working on, again, primarily for the severe vision impairment, the cane controller, the MS3D soundscape, audio through the bone conducting headphones that allow you, again, to understand what's going on around you through these uh, virtual transmitters. I think it's great, but it's predominantly for the severe vision impairment. I think we can, we can do this also for a thing. I've been really impressed with the Mount Rogers project that will enable not only the partially sighted, but been able to orient the person in space with regard to what he's looking at. We still have some problems, I think, uh, uh, in talking about for, for those with good vision, how much resolution we have, uh, but hopefully that's going to be improved in the near future as our screens improve. Okay, I think it's a tremendous project. And using the non-dominant hand as well as the dominant hand for different tasks, great ideas with this, okay, to allow the person to really do it. But they've got to be able to see, because most people can't touch type the way, at least I was trained to do it. So they've got to be able to see the uh, tablet and to be able to visualize those keys and maybe use the Columbus method of discover and land as they're typing. Okay. And the PRISM project, low-cost cameras to add to the MR goggles, to add real-world video-based. Um, again, I haven't had a chance to really look at this very much, but, uh, or to, 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 but I'd like to learn more about it. Okay. And the HoloLens 2, I want to know much more about it because of the um, pupil tracking using the uh, pupil lab's um, uh, vision tracking inside of it, I think, again, is a, is a tremendous potential for doing this and for resolving the external world as well as what you're trying to view and or with um, uh, virtual reality kind of uh, presenting the, the pictures. Are, are, okay, do we have to get out of here so that you can present or what's going on? Oh. Yeah, I know, but are, are, you, you know, the, are we running over? We're, we're officially running over. We have to get out of the room at uh, uh, 2.45. Oh, you're okay with that, you guys? Okay. They're here right. to see you, actually. All right. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so so what I've been talking to Mike is to is to let's develop a much better tablet that will assist the person much better in a lot of the tasks that he wants to do. He gets a lot of paper. I want to be able to image that paper. So we need it positioned in a stand that will allow imaging of the underlying paper, but the tap, but I think the stand has to be portable with the tablet. One. Not like this, where the tablet is sitting on the paper, because it doesn't allow you to do things underneath here that you would like to do and be able to visualize it magnified in the overlying screen. Two is we need to provide the user interface that enable the personalization that I talked about. Okay? Mike and I have talked about a new way of presenting print. Because what I told you is with the magnifiers, if we only have 15, 18 words a minute result in trying to read print, that's poor. So the only resource in the past has been to convert it to OCR and listen. Mike and I have been talking about RSVP print. Rapid sequential visual presentation. So the whole idea here is think about what happens when you're trying to read. You've got to look at the left-hand side of the print with both eyes, see as many letters. You don't see individual letters. You just see word forms. Then you've got to saccade your, your view to the next group of words, the next group of words, the next group of words. Alan Wood all tried to get us to expand that field of view, but we're often limited. If your right field of view is limited because of that macular generation that you saw with those atrophic zones, that screws up. The eyes don't know, one eye or the other eye doesn't know, how far do I move to the right? So typically the saccades, remember your brain turns off during that motion. 
So when your brain turns off, you, so you come to here and say, oh, I'm not in the right place. Oh, I'm not in the right place. So the saccades, the motions, take up three quarters of the time, not less than one quarter of the time. So if we could define where your vision problem is, we ought to be able to go bam, 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 bam here in one place and allow you to see without having to move your eyes. OK, we need to control it. So what uh, I thought about is we'll make a little verti vertical rib on the trackpad. When you move your hand over to the right, that speeds up the print. When you move it to the left, whoop, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I press the left button. When you move it to the left, it, it goes back. Because typically when we're reading, we go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. So this allows you to, um, and we've been able to it significantly increase the reading speed in a number of these patients by using this kind of text. But we're only just beginning this. But we need to understand also the natural word progression. So with longer words, more difficult words, with punctuation, with all of this, we've got to understand what are normal hesitations in this rather than just bang, 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 bang. You say, wait a minute. It's like you're on a runaway train. You know, you've got to be able to control it. Okay? So here's this guy that I showed you before. He's got an area below here that he sees. So we can figure out how big does the print have to be in there, how much spacing between the letters, how many letters can we present. But what we can do is bang, 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 like that, and present it to him in that area of his vision. He's got to be taught how to use it. But this is a derivation of the visual fields that allow now us to really improve the reading in these patients. OK? All right. And OCR can help. In, in, in some of the patients, they said it really helps. Others say it's, it, it just messes up their comprehension. So again, this is something that needs to be put in there. OK. All right, I'm going to just present real quickly some projects for you to think about. Shopping. Shopping. OK? What do you do when you're shopping? You're going down these long aisles, and you've got to sort of say, all right, where do I find the uh, uh, cereals for today? OK, then you've got to go. And then there are arm's length tasks where you want to compare products. OK, right, well, right now with the AI um, site, you have to basically, you can turn around and read the barcodes. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's really cumbersome. So I think we need to somehow put into glasses goggles, some way of identifying, whether it's the OrCam or some other derivation, how do we, though, know where he's going to be looking? Do we have a little laser printer or a laser pointer that will point and turn the bottle around or something? So this, I just want you to think about this, because this is a real difficult project in people who can't get their family to drive them. They've got to go. They've got to shop. How do you do prepared foods? How do you assess colors and textures in this in the fresh foods, OK? So I think if we could somehow get Whole Foods to not only put the barcode or the price on the shelf, but if they could put a, CR, a QR code and tell about the constituents from the bottles, God, it would help you a great deal in not only the visually impaired person, but also the normal person is just trying to look at, oh, which ones are the gluten freeze? Which ones are the. Da, 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 da. I think we're becoming more sensitive to this, and we've got to enable it. Whether Whole Foods will do this, uh, I, th I doubt it, but we've got to start thinking about this, OK? How do you select meat, OK? How much does it weigh? Is it going to be fresh? Well, you know, when they show you meats in stores, it's under a blue white lighting because it makes the meat look red and fresh. The fish is under white lighting. Chicken is under white lighting. OK? But again, how do we assess this? I think if we can use haptics, I was talking to Mike about the possibility of using haptics and other things to try to assess, maybe with a hyperspectral camera, we can define much better the ripeness, the freshness, the appropriate, right now, I talked with the, with the uh, one of the people from Whole Foods. And, when do you remove your muffins and your breads from the shelf? Ten days after they're put on the shelf. Well, how do you know that they don't have a fungus and whatever 
Okay, so I think we need much better ways to assess this, especially if you're shopping online. How do you assess what's gonna, what you're going to get from Whole Foods versus Giant versus Acme? I think that I'm sort of saying, well, maybe we need some sort of independent company that will go in there and use their hyperspectral camera and use their stuff and define. We'll get five chefs to walk in and, oh, man, these are really fresh, and then you... We get the quantitative, I don't know. I'm just throwing these out there because I think this is a real problem. Okay, onward. One of the problems that's really social that I see from my pa pa patients is recognizing faces down the hall. Is there some way we can do it? We're going to have to enhance the facial contrast, then textures, okay? Because the textures help you to see those facial features much better. Is it because there's two approaches, right? One approach is to enhance the features yeah, that what they're seeing. judge for themselves. Yeah. The other approach is just to use an automated system where the automated system is identifying that Stephen Sinclair and just telling you which okay. do people prefer. I think you ought to use the latter, but I heard that Google Glasses ran into a problem with some sort of aspect of this cloud-based AI with the inference on the part of the people who were being imaged that, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and so um, I want, I would, I would prefer some sort of combination so you can enhance it so that, so that the camera can detect the, the facial features easier and the emotional characteristics as well, which are different from the facial recognition characteristics. Because you've got to see what that beautiful gal is, is thinking about what you're saying across the table. <laughs> okay, reading instructions for appliances and all these things for these people, we've got, we, perhaps we can direct them to a website with a QR code so they can be able to go and read the instructions much better than in that paper form that they get with all of their appliances and stuff. We've got to be able to enable them to, to see this. Okay, the thing though that I think is encumbering to a lot of your work is the social ex ex acceptance of these goggles. And I know that you're expecting to improve these dramatically, but I think there's also other ways we could go here. The Bose spectacle frames now are equipped with audio, so I think the eSight, the AI, and that stuff, we could convert to that, hopefully, with little cameras and stuff, with the Audible. And the OrCam, can we hook this to the different ones and get more um, uh, VR, virtual reality, you know, presentation or, or whatever, I, I think. But again, we have to be careful about the AI aspect. But the OrCam uses finger pointing, and so you can't go down the hallway and say, oh, uh, 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 hi, George. Uh, 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 uh. So we've got to find a better way of directing and, and doing this, okay? I think so. If, but how, how well can we do this? I, that, see, you've got to tell me this because I'm not aware yet how good it is on these uh, pupil labs or the Toby uh, ones that are in your glasses. All right, I want to get you interested in kiddos. Just real quick, we'll finish up here. We've got one minute. Okay, um, we started this kid site program because kids, overall, we don't discover their vision problems until age five, six when they go to school. That's the first time that we get any kind of formal testing. And it's usually done by a nurse in a hallway with a Snellen chart, and the kid usually memorizes it and blah, 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 all that bit, okay? Or it's, it's very poor, okay? We need an interactive video game that will measure their vision as they play, either with some sort of down-the-hallway measurement of their, you know, uh, different things. Now, I, I developed Fred the Frog, Freddy the Frog, who would go around the garden, and these insects would move around him, and the... Uh, 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 the 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 um, uh, star or, or triangle the thing would appear on his chest, and then he had to identify which of the insects had the same um, thing. So we would increase or decrease the size of of this one to measure the central vision, and then we'd increase or decrease the size of the um, images that would appear on the side. We tried to do it in a kid's site. This was about 20 years ago because we got some funding through um, Ronald McDonald House, but uh, it, it was put on back burner. Uh, so I think we need both an app on a tablet as well as 
down a hallway and interaction so we can screen kids, yes, in schools in a much more reliable way, but we can also have a tablet that they can play with at age two, one and a half or two, because kids now are using tablets to play games, very early age, when we have a chance to alter a lot of the visual aspects during the growth and brain um, learning. So I'm saying, think about this. Think about this, please. OK? Thanks very much. Uh, the slide deck that's on the Dropbox, uh, these are my Sinclair Technologies Clear Vision and Sinclair Retina. <laughs> and uh, yeah, OK. OK, OK, so it's two. I'm one minute over. I apologize for keeping you so late. I hope it's been entertaining. I hope it's helped you to better understand some of the things that I'm thinking about our failure as ophthalmologists, optometrists, and whatever to really measure what we're doing. We're driven a lot by the pharmaceutical industry when it comes to macular disease management, and we're doing a lousy job. We have a lot of new therapeutic laser technologies and stuff that are coming down the line, but we've got to be able to predict the disease, detect it a lot earlier. So any of you or sons or daughters of patients with macular degeneration start having photographs taken age 50, 55, once a year so we can overlay them and track them and predict it because with this new therapeutic laser we're able to reduce the risk of, in, of progression by about 85 percent. So we've got ways now that we can start applying earlier and we don't have to resort to injections in the eye but, but we've got to develop better assessment and then I'm asking you to help uh, and, I, and finally um, I, I, I would like to get involved. I, I think the, the projects that I've been hearing have been phenomenal. And I'd like to sort of give you my slant sometimes on things. If you want to call me and ask me about our questions, I'll answer them however I can. Or I want to get you interested in some of the projects that I'm going to do. Thanks. Any questions before we uh, break up? Now, we'll be, a, we'll be available back over in the uh, coffee section in about 20 feet to the south of here if you want to cheese more inappropriate. I've got a question yeah. for Steve and Steve's brother. <laughs> Thank you. So, so you killed the rat, you brought it back to life, yeah. and we got to kill it again. My question is, where is this rat people? <laughs> no, we were. Uh, I was watching these hamsters that would that would hibernate and stuff. And I said, "Why can't I get a, a rat to hibernate?" So I got I got a physician locally in in uh, Phoenix who sort of said, "Okay, Steve, we'll try this." And so we put them in my mom's refrigerator, and we would try to measure their O2 consumption and CO2 production, everything. And finally, my mother said, "Steve, I got to buy you another refrigerator." <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs>